Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm really happy to be here to be able to tell you a little bit about our experience at the International Pacific Halibut Commission and some of the progress we've made in the last several issues on a lot of the issues that we've been talking about over the last several days. I think it's uh, quite, quite relevant. So I don't have time to give you a full history of the Halibut Commission and the Halibut stock, um, but suffice to say that we've got over 100 years of a strong fishery in the, in the Pacific. Um, the Halibut Commission for 90 of those years has been operating under joint treaty between the U.S. and Canada, managing the entire stock of halibut on the west coast of North America. And during that time period and through several cycles of up and down due to environmental and other conditions, um, we've, we've had a strong fishery over this whole period that's extracted uh, almost 7 billion pounds of halibut sustainably from the North Pacific. So we have a pretty long history here, even by North American standards. Okay, so what I want to talk mostly about today is the evolution of scientific advice at the IPHC. Like many places, historically, we produced point estimates. We would generate the best model we could, produce a point estimate. That point estimate from the model was turned directly into a quota, which was passed to managers who usually just took it as the truth and, uh, and moved on from there. And over 35 years, we've spent a lot of time chasing the perfect assessment model. We've tried to model, we, 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 we struggle with dispersal and migration, environmental effects on recruitment, uh, time varying and spatially varying growth, natural mortality, all the issues that make stock assessment interesting if you're the one doing it or um, a little scary if you're the one trying to use the results. Um, all of these issues have applied to halibut over this time period. And during this time, we've tried a whole bunch of different ways to, to model these things. Um, our, the development of our stock assessment model mirrors the development of stock assessment methods in general. We've gone from, from pretty basic models, yield, yield and yield per, yield per recruit, through to more complicated models. We've had catch at age, um, migratory models, models with spatial cells and without spatial cells. And, and the, in a nutshell, every few years, the, the model of the day seems to break down. Something goes wrong with it, the, the, bio, the biology catches up, and we end up having to change that model. So over time, we've had this recurring pattern of the, the scientists saying, hey, we got the right model. We get, don't worry, we got it this time. And a few years later, no, nah, actually, we don't have it. We've got to make another change. And uh, actually, that wasn't it either. We've got to make another change. Um, and this has been going on now for three and a half decades. Um, and I, I would assert to you that it's not getting better. So hold that thought. We'll get back to what to do about that. During this time period, we also introduced the concept of uncertainty. So yeah, we had just point estimates in the beginning. And at some point, we started reporting uncertainty in these models. Um, generally, uncertainty has been treated as a garnish. It's that little piece of vegetables next to your steak. It's got to be there on the plate, but nobody really wants to eat it. And you didn't buy it for, the, for, the, for that. You, you bought it for the main course. Um, yes, there are some systems now, the precautionary approach and the P-STAR approach, which you've heard about already this week for U.S. systems, that have started to use uncertainty explicitly in management decisions. But in most cases, it's a, yeah, put some fuzz around the answer, but give me the point estimates, because that's what I want to use, actually use. Um, and we, we were in that situation for a long time. So in 2012, we had a performance review and there were three main recommendations that came out of that, an independent review of our entire system. The first was to strengthen our assessment process. The second was to improve the transparency of the commission's decision-making process. And the third was to strengthen the delineation between science and policy, to make it really clear which were the scientific choices and which were the management choices. And we took this pretty seriously. Um, in fact, that's, that's actually part of why I got hired at the commission, was to start working on some of these. And the first change we made was to move from point estimates with uncertainty to a full risk assessment using a decision table. So in this way, we would measure, we would provide an illustration of the trade-offs between the benefits being catch levels and potential risk. And we worked with our stakeholders and our commissioners to identify a small handful of metrics that they felt like were the key points in making a decision. They wanted to know, is the stock going to go up or down in the next couple of years? Is the fishery catch going to go up or down? Are we liable to trigger any of our reference points? And so we, we generated a very small set of metrics by which they could gauge the results of each year's assessment process. And when we filled in this table, this is now catch levels on the left and metrics across the top, we filled in this table with probabilities from the stock assessment, the probability of something bad happening given a certain level of catch. And so somebody can read across here and see, well, OK, I pick a catch level that I'd like, and I can see the probability of any given risk 
Or I can focus on a certain metric that I'm interested in and see what the probability of that risk is given different levels of catch. So we basically cooked all the analysis down into one-stop one shopping, one, one table. And this, this is not unique. This has been done in other places. You, you've heard several talks that have talked about decision tables already. What's interesting about this process is that that sort of approach with that table can already include the uncertainty within a stock assessment model. It can include the uncertainty among different stock assessment models. And that first year, we included uncertainty in natural mortality. So this is just the same, the stock trend estimated with three different levels of natural mortality. And that can be embedded in that table. All three of these results were used to generate the probabilities in that table. OK, so that leads us then to multiple model methods. And it, we've heard several talks already about statistical ways to deal with multiple models, and Bayes factors, Bayesian model averaging, likelihood ratios. These all work great, except that they all fail to capture major sources of uncertainty. They only work if you hold the data constant and you hold the likelihood components constant. But oftentimes, the real questions are, should we fit a model to spatially disaggregated data or combined data across space? Or should we use this likelihood for this compositional data or a different one? Um, should we weight the data differently? And I would argue perhaps even more important than that are analyst effects. So we'd like to think that anybody could sit down and generate the same stock assessment, but in fact that's not the case. If you bring a different team of assessment scientists in, you'll get a different answer. It may not be very different, but it'll be a different answer. And, it, and that's not a good property of doing stock assessment. What we'd like to have is the results of the stock assessment independent of the analysts that are, that are doing it. We'd like, to, we'd like to be robust to the fact that I did it or somebody else did it. So over, the, over these 30 years, we've had a lot of changes in models. And we've had variable stock estimates come out of those. We changed natural mortality a little bit between this year and that year. And the, the catch advice changes dramatically. And as I've said, that's not a property that we'd like to have. What we need to remember is that the goal is to understand the stock dynamics and to pass that on to decision makers. It's not searching for the perfect stock assessment model. As modelers, we get caught up in this, this attempt to find, you know, maybe if I just added a little more biological realism, I could get it right this time. And the truth is there is no perfect model. All of these stock assessments are abstractions of reality. None of them are the truth. And I think what we need to do is just move beyond this paradigm of searching endlessly for the, for the perfect stock assessment model. And so to, to do that at the commission, we moved in 2013 to ensemble-based risk assessment. And we, you know, we're not the first people to run into this problem. Ensemble modeling comes from climate and weather forecasting. And this is a case where um, they've been doing this for some time with regard to hurricane forecasting. So this is a case where this is a hurricane track projected forward. And each of these lines here represents a different team of modelers generating their estimate of where that hurricane is going to go. And if you show this to a manager, well, they, they, they know what you're talking about immediately. And I think maybe the reason that there's been so much progress on this front is because as much as we like to take fish very seriously, people take hurricanes even more seriously. Um, and in fact, that's pushed them to really drive this and to realize that it's not OK to just present one of these, these runs. When you're trying to describe something that's potentially going to wipe out somebody's house or city, it's important to express that uncertainty among these, these different models. Um, and if you've got teams of credible scientists that can't agree where that's going to go, you know, how, how does that make us look when we come up and bring one model to the table and say, this is the answer. Take, take our word for it. We're sure we're not going to change it again next year. So the point I'm trying to make here is that one model is not enough. Depending on where you live, one projection model, one fishery stock assessment model, the choices you're trying to make, one model is not enough to do the job. And often the models that we need to compare among are not ones that lend themselves to easy statistical comparisons. They, they've got some great analogies um, in, the, in the hurricane forecasting realm. And this is just a, an, a, an, an illustration, a good reminder of why uncertainty is so important. Um, you can see here in the middle, this is, this is a hurricane track projected forward toward a city. And in the middle here, if there's low uncertainty, they're probably not going to evacuate that, in, that city. But on the right-hand side, same track, same expected value with high, greater amount of uncertainty, well, now that city's starting to notice. Maybe they're going to buy sandbags. Maybe they're going to buy extra water. Maybe they're actually going to evacuate. But this is a good illustration of why it's important for us to be presenting the uncertainty along with the point estimates. Because if your decision-making process responds to the uncertainty, it's just as important as the point estimate itself. So we've done, we did quite a bit of modeling in 2013. We had a model we'd been using for a while. We developed some, an analog to that model using a completely independent piece of software and making some pretty different assumptions. We also 
given that we have 100 years of, of great historical data to commission, we built a long time series model that included 100 years more data. There's no easy statistical way to compare those, those approaches. Um, but we felt like, well, each of these three models, if we took them to a review, and we did, and discussed them and investigated them, they all sort of passed muster. So how are we going to just choose one? Well, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should just use all three. And so we did. This is the results from all three of those models, and you can see they're generally pretty consistent at the end of the time series, although in terms of where we've been, and here I've cropped them down to just the last few years where they're most comparable, um, so you can see what's going on. But we, we decided, well, it's probably not a good idea to just pick one of these models. Let's use an ensemble approach. Now, you've probably gotten to the point now where you've figured out the punchline here, which is that ensemble modeling requires some way to weight these models. And I've already told you that the statistical approaches don't work. So here's the secret method for weighting these models. You just got to get over it. This is subjective. Yes, it is subjective to, to just assign these a weight. But it's not as subjective, I would argue, as just picking one of those, which is exclusive. If we just pick one model and throw the rest away, that's like assigning all the weight to one model. So yeah, it's, it's subjective. But I think getting it out there on the table um, is actually a good part of the process. So we, did, we, in fact, we integrated those models. And we, we presented that to the managers in terms of the probabilistic description of the, the, the aggregate of these three models. So the median, or the 50-50 line, the, the colors representing the chance out of 100 of, of that being um, the, the, the state for the stock. And we, 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 you'll notice I made a change here from percentages to chances out of 100 between 2012 and 13. That was another piece of feedback we received, is that people like to think about 8 times out of 10 or 50 out of 100. A lot of people not, not as comfortable with percentages, even though for us it probably doesn't make that much difference. It was a good reminder that we really needed to check in with our stakeholders and find out what worked for them. So we integrated the results of this, and we integrated this into the projection as well. So now all three of those models, and actually they differed more in, their, in the projections than they did in the, in the current status, all three of those models fed into projections at different levels of removals about where the stock was going to go over the next one, two, or three years down the road. We further enhanced the decision table a bit um, in, in an effort to further separate science and policy we separated the decision table into two pieces. The first part, purely looking at stock trend, which is, which is policy free. Um, and again, the, the uh, managers could look and, and see a catch level and decide what level of risk for a various metric they were willing to take and see what that corresponded to in terms of catch levels. The second part of the table was with regard to our harvest policy. And it had to do with our reference points, the harvest rate, the probability of dropping below our biomass reference points. And this, this, we separated this part because this part has embedded in it the objectives of the fishery, the harvest policy itself. What, what are we trying to achieve out of the fishery? So again, trying to achieve more, more separation between the science and the policy. Now, I'm sure some of the cynics here might be saying to yourself, well, you've, you've admitted that you don't know the, the, the exact answer, and you've shown all this uncertainty. Um, probably the manager is just going to walk all over you now and do whatever they want to do, maybe raise the quotas. Well, in fact, Actually, that wasn't our experience. So this is the harvest rates that we've seen over the last few years. And they were fairly high in this time period. That's another story. That was a retrospective pattern in, in a previous model that we were sticking to. Uh, but the point is that over the last couple of years, the adopted values that the, that the commissioners selected have brought us well back down toward the, what we call the blue line, which is our target harvest rate, consistent with our harvest policy. So in fact, in light of all this uncertainty, they've actually opted for a fairly set of conservative decisions over the first two years of this process. And in fact, we've got some great feedback. Uh, it's, it's actually quite refreshing when a scientist tells a manager that they don't know the answer of something specifically. And you know what? They, they already knew that. Even though we were telling them we had the right answer, they, they sort of already knew that we didn't know exactly how many fish were out there. So there's a lot more room for development here, developing more models to go into this ensemble. Um, and once you've sort of broken the seal on this, you can include any types of models. Um, spatial models, we can look at different ways of, of weighting the data and treating the data. Should we run lengths through an age length key and fit them as ages, or should we fit them directly as lengths? Things that don't lend themselves to good, good comparisons. Um, in addition, I think what the next step here is to start looking at ways to evaluate these ensembles in terms of model performance. That's the big difference between fisheries and hurricane forecasting is a month later, they know where the hurricane went. A year later, we don't actually know how many fish there were last year unless we got it really, really wrong. So 
I give us a, a, a plus in terms of short-term tactical information. We've made some good progress there, but we actually haven't made much progress in terms of long-term strategic information. We haven't reevaluated our harvest policy to go with these changes. And so the next step, which is coming soon, is the risk assessment with some tuned management procedures. And we're, we're getting to that via first outlining what are the objectives for the fishery, working with our stakeholders to uh, define these objectives and illustrating the trade-offs among them. And then we're going to be performing a management strategy evaluation to find tuned procedures to help guide the decisions that actually meet these objectives. So they know over the long term, if we make decisions in this way, we're going to achieve what we're trying to achieve. So a couple, just a couple conclusions and then I'm done. First is, you knew this already, <coughs> uncertainty is here to stay. We can't duck it and we need to report it. Um, our job really is not just modeling, it's making sure that the decision makers get what they need to make good decisions. And often there's a lot more to it than just trying to find the best model to represent um, reality. And I'd have to say that giving up your single best stock assessment model, although it's a little scary, especially if you've been doing that model for quite a while, it's kind of liberating because you realize that now you're freed up to really investigate the dynamics and really investigate what's going on and try to understand the stock rather than focusing on one specific model. So I'd like to thank our scientific review board and um, our staff and all of the people that have been, been involved in this process. It's been quite an interesting process over the last couple of years. And thank you for listening. Thank you.